providing health care to the original Dakotans, Native American Health, tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight our show is one we recorded in Rapid City during the fall of 2016. We'll not be able to take your calls tonight, but get ready for a fascinating story. The mission of the Indian Health Service is to raise the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of American Indians and Alaskan Natives to the highest level and to assure that comprehensive, culturally acceptable, personal and public health services are available and accessible to American Indians and Alaskan Native people. But are they fulfilling those hopes? Tonight we'll address this question and issues about diabetes, about telemedicine, uh, about a ton of very important issues uh, that we'd like to talk about. Joining us tonight is Dr. Don Warren, MD, Chair of the Department of Public Health at North Dakota State University, family practitioner, diabetologist, and master of public health. And with us is Sandra Ogunrami, who is Director of Native American Collaboration at Regional Health, who has a doctorate in health administration. Welcome, Don and Sandra. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So it's a great opportunity for people to learn about what's going on in our state in North Dakota. Uh, Don, tell us about your journey. I mean, you know, you, you're a master of public health. You're, what is special about uh, a master of public health in North Dakota State University? Well, actually at NDSU, we offer the only Master of Public Health in the nation with an American Indian specialization. So our students can get a Master of Public Health focusing on Indian health. Uh, so that's what's it's the uh, only one in the country. Only one in the nation. Really, yeah. really. Yeah. So you're a physician, family physician. Tell us about that. I mean, where are you from originally? Well, I'm originally from Kyle, South Dakota. So Kyle. Not, not too far from here in Rapid City. And when I was in grade school, uh, my family and I moved to Arizona. So I spent most of my childhood in Arizona. But we spent our summers coming back here to South Dakota. So growing up, I just assumed every child went to South Dakota for the summers. It turns out not everybody that, did. They don't. But, no, <laughs> no. but in my family, that's what we did. But it was a wonderful opportunity because they have a lot of uh, uncles and other relatives who are traditional healers and medicine men. So I was able to learn a lot about our traditional culturally based ways of medicine from childhood. And uh, based wow, that, on that, I mean, that's fascinating. You think the, uh, the real Indian American uh, medicine man story. Yeah, yeah. And actually, my uh, Lakota name is Pejuta Wichasha, which means medicine man. So I was actually named really? after my grandfather. Yeah. That uh, was easy for you to say. Say that again. Pejuta Wichasha. Which means medicine man. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so it was my grandfather's uh, Lakota name as well. So I was given his name in a traditional ceremony many years ago. And I was doing well in college, um, but during this time I was kind of having a struggle trying to determine whether or not I wanted to go just purely the traditional culturally based healing uh, arts or even consider going to medical school. But I was doing well in school, so I was being encouraged to become a pre-med. And in truth, I was kind of worried about what my uncles would say about that, if they'd be disappointed, kind of go to the dark side of medicine, yeah, so yeah. to speak, as opposed to the culturally based side. But actually the opposite happened. They were very encouraging. And one of my uncles, uh, Ray Takeswerb on it, he told me, I think this is a good idea, but if you do this, always remember where you come from, remember who you are as a Lakota person, and hang on to that as the, the source of strength to learn their way of medicine. And the only way that you'll be taken seriously in modern medicine is to go to their best schools and learn their way of medicine and know it at least as well as they know it. So for me, that was very inspiring. So I was able to um, go to medical school at Stanford University, then became a family doctor. And after several years working as a primary care physician, went back to get my master of public health at Harvard University. So, and you have a master of public health, and then you came back yeah. and uh, because they gave you an opportunity to be the head of the public health department. Worked in a couple of areas first. So I was on faculty at Arizona State University for a while. I also worked for the National Institutes of Health doing diabetes research in Arizona. And then I was the health policy research director for Intertribal Council of Arizona. But during this whole time frame, I had wanted to come back to South Dakota. So when I came back here in 2008, 
I was the executive director of the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, and that's a consortium of the 18 tribes in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa. So I was here for a few years, and then in 2000. 11 became the chair of the Department of Public Health at NDSU. So I've kind of worked in a number of different areas yeah. with academics, research, primary care medicine, and public health. Now the, the state of North Dakota has a public health department and that's not what you are. You are a, a professor teaching at the, or a assistant professor or whatever they, you know, they put you at the school then. Yeah, so it's a school of health professions and within the school, is the uh, Department of Public Health. So I'm chair of the Department of Public Health. But yeah, there are public health departments at the state level, certainly yeah. South Dakota and North Dakota both yeah, have that. Right. And I also serve on the Board of Regional Health, which is really my neat. other connectivity back to uh, yeah. Rapid City. Brings you to Rapid City. You have a board meeting tonight or exactly, something. Exactly, like that. yes. That's, that's, so Sandra, tell me really what it is that your responsibility is for regional health at this time. I am the director of Native American Collaboration, and that was a role that was created officially in uh, 2015, a year and a half ago, where we determined that it was important to bring together people to focus on a Native American collaboration. And so I work with a lot of external organizations, the Indian Health Services here in Rapid City, in Pine Ridge, Rosebud. We have services in Cheyenne River that I oversee. We work with the Great Plains Era Indian Health Services and with the National Indian Health Services. And so um, my job is to ensure that we continue to be innovative. Um, we use initiatives and um, we improve on what currently is going on, both with health organizations and with non-health organizations. And you know, when I was offered this opportunity, I began to think about the definition of uh, health, you know, by the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. And in 1948, the World Health Organization defined health as um, a, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and, and infirmity. And so for me, I focus on the social well-being aspect to say, you know, what are the resources that we need? And if you think about social well-being, uh, some define it as an end state of having basic needs met where you have people coexisting um, in peace within communities and also having opportunities for advancement, resources, basic resources, water, food, shelter, right. health. Right. And so I focus on that health aspect and us coexisting peacefully within the community while working collaboratively. And so it's just a privilege and an honor to be able to bring people together for the greater good of our community. Let's talk about social well-being. Don, you, you're, uh, I mean, I know you know diabetes, you know, I mean, and she gave some numbers, 800%. Th those don't make sense to me. First, I would ask you to talk about those numbers she was, she was explaining. How frequent do we see diabetes in, in well, that population? Yeah, so th there's different ways to look at it. So there's new cases, which is the incidence rate. There's the number of people who have the disease, which is the prevalence or the percentage of people. But then there's also the mortality rate, people dying from it. And the biggest disparity is actually in mortality. Mm -hmm. So we have more people with diabetes, but American Indians with diabetes die at a much higher rate, mm -hmm. simply because we don't have access to the social conditions mm -hmm. that allow people to live with diabetes in a healthier manner. So we don't have access to healthy food. Quite often in our reservation communities, there's not safe places to go out for a walk, very narrow BIA roads, Bureau of Indian Affairs roads that are not well maintained, no sidewalks, for example. Um, and then many of our reservation communities are food deserts, so quite often people have to drive all the way to Rapid City to go to the, the supermarket. So there's all kinds of social circumstances that lead to challenges in managing diabetes. So it's more than just thinking of an overall rate. It's the incidence, which is new cases, prevalence, which is the percentage of people who have it, but the worst disparity by far is the number of people dying from it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <clears throat> that brings us to the Indian Health Service. Uh, whose responsibility has been, as I stated earlier, you know, to try to do all these good things. Uh, but it's, a, it's an almost impossible task if you can't even encourage them to go out for a walk because there's no sidewalks and the, the roads are, and there's dogs and there's danger out there. What, how can that be changed? 
Well, if you recall, even from your initial um, introduction talking about the Indian Health Service, that part of the role is medical services and public health services. So the Indian Health Service is located within the United States Public Health Service. Mm -hmm. Ironically, because of underfunding, Indian Health Service does very little in the way of public health. They spend most of their resources on emergency care and dealing with crises. And crisis, crisis, crisis. Exactly. And, and a series of crisis management and that gobbles up all of the resources so we have very little actually to invest in public health that's part of the mission it's even in their mission statement so when we think of the Indian Health Service it's also important to remember why it exists in the first place and the basis for Indian Health Service largely is because of the treaties that were signed between the tribal nations and the federal government and in the treaties quite often the language included things like a promise of all proper care and protection in exchange for land and natural resources. So when we think about uh, the United States and all of the tremendous wealth that we have here in the U.S., much of that wealth is based on our natural resources that we've been able to utilize. Mm. But we have to remember those are American Indian resources, and we didn't lose those resources in a war. We exchanged them through treaties for certain social services, including housing, education, and health care. So that's why there's a BIA, a Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's why there's a BIE, Bureau of Indian Education. And that's why there's an IHS, an Indian Health Service. So I look at the IHS as the largest prepaid health plan in history yes. because yes. we exchanged so much uh, for those services. The challenge has been Congress has not lived up to its trust responsibility, and they've been underfunding Indian Health Service for decades, which is why it is underperforming. It's largely an issue of underfunding. So we get less than $2,000 per patient per year in Indian Health Service, less than 2,000. Medicare is over 12,000 per patient per year. Veterans Administration is wow. about 7,000 yes, per yeah. patient per year. So 2,000 per patient per year. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think People don't realize that. No. That's they think, things. oh my, they're just yeah. throwing money yeah. after yeah. money, money, money. That's yeah. not the case. No, it's not the case. No. We're actually, um, we've been starving the Indian Health Service for, for generations. And I hear a lot of people saying IHS is broken, IHS doesn't work. Well, we don't know if it's broken. It's been starved. We've never adequately resourced it. <laughs> yeah. So the, the analogy I like to use is if you have a car that needs a full tank of gas to get to its destination, but every day you only put a half a tank of gas in, you can blame the car, you can blame the road, you can blame the driver, but ultimately you have to blame the people who are not putting enough gas in the yeah. tank, and that's Congress. <laughs> and, Sandra, and, you, and, and, and to add to that, they have the contract health service delivery area, you know, called the CHISDA, and a lot of people don't know okay, that you contract health service delivery area, and the acronym is CHISDA, okay. and um, when you, li when you li leave the area of your CHISDA, you are no longer eligible for purchased care. So what that then means is that if you are supposed to be in the Cheyenne River area and you come to Rapid to visit a relative and, and then you get sick. and then you get ill, you're expected to go to Susan, but if it's care that they need to refer out, you do not you have to pay out of your own pocket and you do not get that care. Um, through an Indian Health Service because you've left the area where they're supposed to guarantee you or provide the care if they have the funding at that time. So think about you and I. I've never had to stop to think, can I go to Michigan? Can I go to Kansas City? I get on a plane and I go, knowing that my insurance will kick in and will pay most of it and I might have a, a deductible, but that's it. That is not applicable to our Native American communities. They are forced to receive care within defined areas their in chisdas. South Dakota, within their yeah. chisdas. Yeah. Well, that, that, I didn't realize that either. Um, I've heard uh, Senator Round uh, say that there was a 40% something and they're not gonna, they're, we're not going to go higher than that. Do you, do you remember what he said or do you, does that ring a bell to you, Don? No, I'm not sure exactly um, what that's referring to, but I know there's reluctance to add more funding to IHS. Yes. And it's kind of a chicken and the egg type of scenario. Basically, Congress is saying, we're not going to give you more money because you're not functioning well. But they're not functioning well because they've never had enough money. Yeah. So, so in that way, Congress may not want to acknowledge their role, but they are complicit in the the poor performance of IHS through chronic underfunding. Veterans Administration complains about not having enough resources. They have more than double the per patient budget than Indian Health Service. So imagine cutting IHS budget in half 
or I'm sorry, cutting the Veterans Administration budget in half, and, and then expect them to perform at the same level. And, and see what the v veterans would be saying about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, uh, right here in Rapid City, heroic efforts to help young people are being spearheaded. I want to make sure that this is uh, clarified, and we have an interview with Bruce Longfox. His story is fascinating. Our target population is primarily uh, the ones who have come from the reservation within the last 12 uh, months, and we call them the transitional uh, population. And we try to help them get settled here in town. In a lot of ways, we act as a bridge program uh, to help them access services uh, and, and to be an advocate for them. Um, most of our our clients are associated with the Head Start and Early Head Start programs. Um, there's about 130 here in, in Rapid City and about 90 over in Crow Creek. We want to re help Native Americans, low-income Native Americans, reestablish uh, family. And we feel like that's the answer for our long-term cultural survi survival, but it also plays uh, into uh, health benefits as well. Uh, to have an intact uh, family with healthy relationships um, makes for healthy children and healthy parents as well. The dropout rate among the Native American population has always been in the mid to high 50%. And uh, when we started working at Central High ten, or f in 2010, the dropout rate was 63%. And after five years of involvement there and doing what we call cultural group mentoring, uh, the dropout rate is 41%. And so there's been a significant decrease. And in 2015, 93% of the seniors who were involved with Rural America Initiatives graduated. At the middle school level that we're, we're doing is Project AIM, Adult Identity Mentoring. And the primary goal of that curriculum is to help the students um, choose what they're going to be when they grow up. It's a long-term goal-setting program. but what we try to do is get them to believe in that vision uh, strong enough so that they will avoid negative behaviors and in increase the number of positive behaviors that they do. If they can ask themselves the question, is that going to help me become a doctor or is that going to help me become uh, a nurse? Um, should I do it or should I not? And the students learn to make more positive, healthier choices. And the outcomes, um, for instance, to, to avoid teen pregnancy so that they can graduate from high school and go on to college. Because if you look at the reasons for failure, uh, the number one reason is, is addiction, whether it, it be to uh, meth or to alcohol, and the, pro the program that we have, which helps the students to do choice making, um, encourages them to be drug and alcohol free. And then we also teach them a set of values, uh, the Lakota values, which also uh, encourage them to be drug and alcohol free. All of our programs have volunteer opportunities. Uh, whether it be tutoring at the high school level or, or just reading to the kids at the Head Start and early Head Start level. Um, they're welcome to contact us and, and become involved that way. Volunteer or uh, help, help the kids to, to learn reading or, or language. And, and all people are welcome to, to volunteer. Thank you, Bruce.
That's, that's very important information. Efforts to help the young people. They say that um, in a third world country like middle of Africa, Congo, whatever it might be, uh, the very best, most powerful weapon is educating young people. Yes. How, how, do, you, how do you see education? You know, he show, he's showing us an, an effort that is happening in Rapid City. Let's talk about education on the reservation or for the Indian population. Don? Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. So just like Indian Health Service is underfunded, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Education are also underfunded. So we tend to have challenges providing high quality education on, in the reservation communities. And we see that there's a strong correlation between quality of education in a community and health status. Yes. So one of the predictors of health is quality of education. So we can't continue to think of things in their own silos. You know, we can look at the grain silo of health and the grain silo of education, but that's not they the They really run way. together, don't they? They it's are one interconnected. Whole. Yeah, it's all connected. So I think that we need to um, recognize that economic development, educational programs, and social programs are all related to health status, are all part of public health, and a lot of uh, good things going on here in Rapid City as well. Well, Rapid City, um, what, 20% of the population in Rapid City is American Indian, or do you know what those numbers are? When you look at the U.S. Census, it says under 10%, but a study was done by USD, and they determined that due to the transient nature, at any given point, we have up to 25% of Native Americans, specifically Lakotas, within Rapid City. And so the percentages are significantly higher than what is captured within the U.S. Uh, Census. So if I were running a hospital, and I had a, a foreign population that was utilizing my emergency room, S a sick population with diabetic problems, for example, or whatever it is, um, oftentimes they will have insurance or they'll have money in which to pay. Rapid City doesn't get reimbursed for, for much of that, is that right? You know, the regional hospitals. When we look at Rapid City specifically, Rapid Regional Health has about 33% of our inpatients our Native American patients. Again, that confirms, again, the increased percentage within the community compared to what the U.S. Census captures. Right. And so when you have 33% being inpatients and they're transient and they've left their CHISDA that we talked about earlier, then they end up being stuck with the bill. When you talk about a population, let's say Pine Ridge, for instance, where unemployment um, rates are as high as 90%, you know, they do not have the resources. When you talk about 97% living below the poverty line, they do not have the resources to then have to pay for their own health care because they got sick, went through the ED, got admitted. People end up presuming that through that they have free health care. Well, their health care is not free. It has been prepaid through treaty rights. And as such, there is a disconnect between what people think is really occurring and what is actually occurring. And so, so those are some of the things that we would love to see fixed. Fixed. You know, and there was an effort to 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 put uh, Medicaid to to uh, uh, advance Medicaid to expand, help cover that. Yeah, yeah expand mm -hmm. it. Yeah. What would happen to that? Um, well, a couple uh, points too. Just wanted to make sure we, um, the term transient has a couple of different meanings. So, just the, when we're talking about transit, we mean that people have, might have a home both at Cheyenne River and in Rapid yes. City. So, moving back and forth, because also the term transit can be kind of a synonym for homeless. So, it's certainly not that everyone's homeless. Yes. People right. are kind of moving back and forth. Like mm -hmm. in my family, we have housing in Kyle and, and in Rapid City. So. And you have in Arizona. And in Arizona, yeah, yeah. So kind of. So oh, you're a real so transit. I'm a real yeah. transit. I'm an <laughs> ultimate transit. I've got a lake cabin, so I'm a transit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Too. I go back and forth. <laughs> So that's what we mean, people moving back and Matt, forth. Yeah. And uh, again, a lot of people come to Rapid City to live for a period of time, but then they're outside of their contract health services delivery area, so they're not eligible to get payment Coverage. for mm -hmm. services provided at regional. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's a big problem is the CHISDAs. One way to fix it is through Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid covers primarily pregnant women and children up to 100% of federal poverty. Now the federal poverty level is remarkably low. If you're a family of four and you make $22,000 a year, you're above the poverty line. So imagine trying to survive on with a family of four at 22000 mm -hmm. But then you're automatically over the poverty line. 
So there's federal poverty, then there's true poverty, which is much, uh, much greater percentage, unfortunately. With Medicaid expansion, then everybody, not just pregnant women and children, but everybody, men, women, children, yeah. everybody, up to 138% of poverty would then have Medicaid. And if you have Medicaid, then the CHISDA doesn't matter because you have insurance. Mm -hmm. so, so it would Indian be a perfect health, answer. It, it is a perfect answer. And actually, we've done this in North Dakota. We have expanded Medicaid. And what we're finding is that about 60% of the American Indian population in North Dakota now has Medicaid or Medicaid expansion. So, so wh why uh, has it not occurred in South Dakota? I mean, you'll have to ask the legislators that. Um, it did not pass our legislation. No, and there's a, um, uh, a sense that, w one, maybe we can't afford it, but that's not true because it's federal dollars. Right. So, uh, oh, but then the federal dollars will go away, and then we'll be stuck with this responsibility and can't take it away. Yeah, that's what I hear time yeah, and time again. It's written into the law that basically the maximum that the state would pay for that that new population with insurance is seven percent, ninety three percent would be covered by the feds. And if they ever did take away, then you can get rid of Medicaid expansion. But from between now and whenever that hypothetical time occurs, essentially it's an opportunity for the state to pay seven dollars and get ninety three in return. So uh, the reasoning behind it, they always say. They don't want to uh, facilitate able-bodied people from you know, getting insurance. But in truth, what they're doing is they're harming the rural hospitals. They're, d they're harming the Rapid state's the economy. Region. Sure. The economy is harmed because those dollars then go to pay for more physicians, more services, hire more people. It's economic development. So there are very few opportunities in which the state can pay 7 and get 93 in return. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're thumbing their nose at it to date. Hopefully it'll change. Our governor is in favor of it. Right. So... That would be an important thing. Uh, I sense, uh, though, uh, you, you gave a number of uh, $2,000 per uh, Native American versus 10000 for Medicare per year. 12000 12000 uh, Do we have numbers on Indian uh, education? You know, I don't have the breakdown in terms of per student per year, but I know it's terribly underfunded. One of the challenges is that when we look at state-funded schools, quite often that's based on the local tax basis. And if you have high rates of unemployment and not a lot of jobs, you're not generating a lot of local taxes to support schools. So um, that's one area where we see a vicious cycle of poverty making education systems worse, which makes poverty worse. Worse. Yeah. You know, and that brings up the uh, unemployed uh, numbers. Uh, there's a prejudice. Okay, they aren't working because they don't want to work. They didn't have to work, or we did this to them you know, uh, by making it too easy, uh, giving them something for nothing and therefore they're not working. Uh, did either one of you have a response to that comment? I have a response. The first time I drove out to Pine Ridge was at the height of the cost of gas, when to fill your tank cost over $60. And I was in a company car, drove to Pine Ridge. And as I was driving out there, the first thing that hit me was, oh my word, this is very far. It's far, you need money to get to Pine Ridge. If you don't have money, you cannot leave Pine Ridge to work. And then you get to Pine Ridge and you realize they don't have the resources to have businesses up and functioning. It is f far removed, isolated, and someone shared with me that it's called the Badlands because you can't really grow crops there. And so you have people that have been put in an area where they can't really farm, they can't really raise a lot of livestock, and they're expected to be very productive, and they're 90 miles away from where they can have good grocery stores. It is indeed a food desert. I've been in the grocery store multiple times, and to get a little bit of fruit is like $6 sometimes, you know, a fresh cut fruit. And so you begin to see that vicious cycle. Things need to change. There needs to be better housing, more opportunities, investments need to be made on the reservation. People can't get up to go to work when there are no jobs available for them to do. Job, and, jobs. Uh, your comment, your response. Well, when there are job opportunities, there's more applicants than there are open mm -hmm. positions. Yeah. So, the, really? the, so there's a workforce that wants to work. They're just limited opportunities. And I think there's a, a history of challenges with um, uh, outside entities having reluctance to put factories or invest in on reservation jobs because the reservations are like a foreign nation. The, the reservation communities are their own sovereign nation. So. It's different than building a factory and wall, for example, where you, know, you can own the land, whereas uh, the companies cannot own the land on the reservation. And that's, that's been a disincentive dis for building a, 
a business or something like that on the reservation. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the challenges. Yeah. Let's talk about the reservations. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a video or a picture of all the reservations in North Dakota and South Dakota. What, what would, what would you, how would you describe them and, and, uh, and uh, explain to me the reservation system? And if the you, nations. Yeah, and if you, if you were not from this region, you wouldn't realize there's such a difference between North Dakota and South Dakota. Yes, but nice. um, in South Dakota, we have nine reservation communities, but they're all Oyate, or the, the, the same tribal people, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. So all nine are one of those three uh, tribes of Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. So in West River, they tend to be Lakota, so Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Shine River, and Standing Rock. Uh, more toward the northeast, they tend to be more Dakota, so Sisseton, Wapaton, Flandreau, um, Crow Creek, for example. Right. Then the only Nakota reservation is Yankton. So in North Dakota, there's a Lakota tribe with Sandy Rock, which borders both North and South mm -hmm. Dakota, okay. Dakota in Spirit Lake. There's also Chippewa, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. And then the three affiliated tribes are Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara. So there's actually five, six tribes and four reservations in North Dakota, where there's nine reservations, but essentially one tribe. One, one yeah. tribe. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting, and the difference between the, yeah. the, the tribes. The and thing, they're all individual nations, too. Yeah, they're all sovereign nations, and what I like to point out is that the Dakotas of the three are the easternmost, and because the uh, white settlers were coming from the east, they encountered the Dakotas first. Right. If they were coming from the west, would this would be South Lakota instead of South Dakota. South Lakota. Yes. <laughs> right. There it is, Dakota. Exactly. So it's a so Dakota is a tribe. Um, let's talk about regional health and what is regional doing to help with on the reservations and outside the reservations for the American Indian. Thank you. Regional Health is actually doing a, very, a lot of wonderful things on the different reservations. We have providers that have been going down for decades. I think about uh, Dr. Lewis Raymond, a nephrologist. He's been in, working in Cheyenne River and Pine Ridge since 1994. Dr. Uh, Fred Birch has been working in Rosebud since 1995. Dr. Iodelio Gunremi since 2003. That's your husband? <laughs> that is my husband. How did you say his first name? Iodeli. Iodeli. Iodeli, yes. Is he from Nicaragua? Uh, <laughs> Nigeria. Oh, His Nigeria. parents are originally from Nigeria, Nigeria as well, but he was born in Scotland, so. Um, Scotland, Scotland, not Scotland, South Dakota, but N Scotland, Scotland. Uh, yeah, Scotland, mm -hmm. Scotland, Edinburgh, so Scotland. Um, we have uh, Beth Iverson, an advanced practice uh, provider that's been working in Rosebud since 95 as well. We have Jackie Garner, who's been working since 2009. She's an advanced practice provider. We have Lee Wren, another advanced practice provider that's been working since 2006. And um, Dr. Mason Nemi, that's been working um, in Cheyenne River for the past four years. And so we've got Rosebud, uh, Cheyenne River, Pine Ridge covered, and they also go to Porcupine, which is in Pine Ridge. We've got those covered for quite a long time. And when Dr. Birch goes to Rosebud, he spends four days in Rosebud. That's a long-term commitment for 21 years. And it's something that we take very seriously. They get up bright and early. They head out because they care. When, when you have patients who need dialysis, you cannot risk them not having their dialysis. You cannot risk not following up on them. So all the people that I've mentioned are all nephrologists and um, advanced practice providers that work with nephrologists. In Pine Ridge, we had um, a specialty services contract with Pine Ridge that we started in 2008. It came to an end in February. But we had cardiologists, Dr. Mod Zinaldine, that went from um, 2008 up until February providing care, and he would get there bright and early, stay, see 20 patients. Um, Dr. Sam Durr, Dr. Penalt, and Dr. Sam Durr is another cardiologist who went down and served within Pine Ridge. Dr. Ellen Penalt, um, a transitionalist who served there for five years. Dr. Durr, um, seven years. Um, we have um, Dr. Haas, who's since retired from a daily practice. He still teaches at the School of Medicine, an endocrinologist mm -hmm. who worked in Pine Ridge for a very number of, uh, for an extensive period of time, number of years um, with us. We just have great people. We currently have an orthopedist who is providing services Mark Harlow. Right there, Dr. Um, Mark Harlow. So we have, we're committed. And recently, um, last year at the peak of uh, the suicide, teenage suicide, um, you know, 150 percent above the national levels, we partnered with external organizations and put two houses there um, to help 
with a, a safe place for kids to go, um, from education to occur for parent with parents. So we partnered with Skull Construction, Habitat for Humanity, um, superior homes right. just to continue making a difference on the reservation so we are very passionate about making a difference and collaborating and working with um, different groups to improve right. access to health let's just say a, a few words about uh, suicide she brought this up uh, Don uh, the, you know that's why would that happen and how can we help well it's, it's a very dynamic problem. So there's not a simple solution or one simple mm. basis for it. So it's a very dynamic and complex process and problem. Um, so it, it goes back to um, historical issues. And we see, for example, there's a, an emerging field of historical trauma and looking at how traumatic events in a population can have a negative impact on the health of subsequent generations. We also have the boarding schools uh, in which children were forcibly taken from uh, reservations in South Dakota and quite often taken more than a thousand miles put in boarding school where they were abused. It, horrible to even think about but physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, children were beaten. Um, next to the many of the boarding schools are huge graveyards in which many many American Indian including people here from here in South Dakota these children between age 6 and 12 died while they were at boarding school. And we don't know exactly why so many died. We know that there were outbreaks of infectious disease like right. tuberculosis, but that doesn't answer the entire question. Right. We probably will never know. So one of our challenges is the ongoing historical issues and subsequent adverse childhood experiences and intergenerational trauma that occurs. And many children grow up in very difficult social circumstances. Here we go. Well, we're, we're gonna hear now from the president of South Dakota State University. We're kind of trapped ourselves into a time period from about 1870 till now and we define a group of people by that period of time and so we have an oral history and some written history of a transition of a people from um, a very um, nomadic way of life for certainly for the Lakota people in western South Dakota to a community-based uh, place-bound uh, lifestyle but those cultural differences are probably understated and under, underestimated and misunderstood. And they really, I think there's a, almost a fundamental communal aspect to certainly the Lakota people that, um, that probably isn't understood well enough in terms of serving them from a public health perspective or a, are serving their health needs. I am personally a big believer in uh, the importance of nutrition and you know it is so fundamental and so when whether that be for the impact of the nutrition of a pregnant um, woman on the unborn um, fetus and baby uh, to you know all the rest of a person's life nutrition is just so important and uh, nutrition on the reservation for I think the general population is um, heavy in calories and low in in some nutritional value and that's that that's manifests itself then in obesity and diabetes and um, heart disease which just compounds every other challenge that they might have, a cold, a fracture, uh, you know, anything. It, it impacts healing, it impacts longevity. Trying to treat symptoms um, yeah, becomes uh, very expensive and uh, kind of a losing battle. In 2014, we were, the, the SDSU extension was awarded a four plus million dollar um, grant to work on um, food deserts, not only here in South Dakota, but in uh, some urban communities. We were the lead uh, um, awardee on the grant, and uh, so we're working on that that aspect of it. So, are, do we have the commitment to take what we've learned from from this great work that uh, SDSU Extension has done here in South Dakota on food deserts and and building communities on that really do attack this challenge of nutrition and, and food access. Do we have the, 
kind of the willpower to take that to scale to make a, uh, a, make a difference. I think that's always the challenge. Thank you, President Dunn. It's really neat. You know, he is such a gentleman, such a great guy, and really a hero for many of us, me as a hero. Um, so let's talk about uh, the uh, adverse childhood experiences that you were talking about earlier, Don, because uh, I, I do think that if a person has a bad experience as a child, you carry it with you forever. I mean, it can be first to two and a half, like our adoptive daughter who had, I think, an adverse experience that young, and it is, carries that burden uh, now yet even. What, yeah. what is your knowledge about Well, there's emerging science that shows the first thousand days are vitally important. What happens in the first three years of life have an impact long term. And one of the challenges we see with high rates of poverty and unresolved trauma in the community is we have traumatized people growing up and having children and then potentially traumatizing the next generation. Mm -hmm. So adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are correlated with terrible health outcomes, including higher rates of substance abuse, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress but also higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So adverse childhood experiences, really, are, that's the upstream area where we need to place more effort. And, right. it's, and it's really consistent with traditional Lakota medicine is to work further upstream and cherish and honor the health of our young ones. Gosh, that just rings so true. And that's a traditional uh, Lakota. Let's hear more about that. Well, there's a traditional story, actually, of three sisters walking along a river. And they see babies and young children in the water struggling to stay afloat. The first sister jumps in and says, this is an emergency. It's a crisis. We need to get the babies out of here right now. The second sister jumps in the water and says, no, we need to teach them how to swim so they can survive while they are in the water. And the third sister keeps walking upstream. And the other two ask her, where are you going? Why aren't you helping us? She says, I'm going to find out who's putting these babies in the water, and I'm going to stop them. <laughs> that's public health. That's traditional medicine. That's literally working upstream. And that's the approach that we need to take with our health challenges now. I heard him tell this story for the first time, I think, six years ago. It changed my life. Wow. Because I understood the way the traditional Lakota people think. And I even use that story now. Good. I use that story because it's so important that we understand that we have to practice a form of public health. We have to have the people in the water teaching the kids how to swim, have the people in the water getting the kids out and people trying to figure out the root cause, how, you know, who's putting them in the water, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. And it makes sense. Um, it's, a, it's a metaphor from which we can all uh, uh, work uh, with all sorts of illnesses, uh, you That's know, it. as a physician and caring for, mm -hmm. for people. But really, public health is an important thing. And really, that's part of why I've gone into uh, some television and radio things. You know, I can one-on-one -on -one with my patient and I can say, you've got to exercise more and, and here are ways of balancing your life and, uh, you know, uh, 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 let go of this fear that you're, you're having. Yeah, and but, re regional health's doing a lot more in the way of community health, too, and I'm excited to see that. Yeah, this community health, it's, it's doing it in a, a larger group. Tell us about what you, you are doing. You know, we're partnering with uh, Susan Hospital and Pine Ridge, and, and, and when we talk about Susan, we're having collaborative meetings and coming together and saying, these are our patients. We share the same patients. What can we do together? And so we're doing a variety of things together, looking at patient information, trying to figure out a patient who went and presented in the urgent care, who should have gone to the ED, who was referred to our system, who didn't make it to our system. And we meet every single week to have these discussions. And in addition to that, we're doing community events. And people sometimes ask me, what's the significance of the community events? Well, guess what? When there has been historical trauma and when there is trust lacking, you build trust. Because if you don't build trust, patients won't comply. You think about distrust and mistrust. When you distrust, you don't, really, you don't trust the reliability of the information being given to you. When you mistrust, you actually approach it with, with a suspicion. So from the get-go, when patients present, because of historical trauma, they're not always sure if they should 
tell you if they should access the care, if they should tell you all that's going on with them, if they should comply with the treatment plan, or if they should not comply with the treatment plan. And so as we're building trust, having community events, being partners with the Rapid City Community Conversation, being partners with the Healers and Transformers group, having the collective impact and having different things that we do that we're doing together by doing all of this we're telling the community we are united we had our first four direction five kilometer run fun walk community unity day and it was i love that it was wonderful we had over mm -hmm. 600 people come out and one of the police officers said we didn't have to be there as people enforcing, we came and we had fun. Yeah. And last week we had the, we celebrated the Native American uh, parade. And again, police officers came out and said, we had fun. They were not concerned about tension. And so we are really making strides to say we must coexist peacefully, which is part of the act, um, part of the aspect of social well-being that I defined earlier on. I, I sense that my own dignity, my own self-dignity is enhanced when I give dignity to, mm -hmm. I see the dignity in every individual. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, of course, I can forgive myself for my problems when I forgive my, the people that I work with uh, and I know and I, I deal with. Be, uh, uh, so it, if, if you give that dignity, if you give respect to people, I think it all comes back to yes. you. We should all learn that lesson that you, you, when you give dignity, it comes back fourfold. Yeah. And that, uh, that's something that I think, you know, uh, we, we, when we're a child and we're not given, we're not treated with dignity, that carries with us uh, a long time. If we as individuals can turn the tide by mm -hmm. the way we treat each other. Uh, you're Absolutely, and well, when we look at this historical trauma and boarding schools, adverse childhood experiences, we also have toxic stress in our communities and adverse adulthood experiences. And part of that is quite honestly dealing with racism. And unfortunately that's alive and well in many parts of the state. And, 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 and exactly with what you're saying, kind of, if we think about all of our historical traditions and belief systems, whether it's about karma, what comes around goes around, or the beatitudes or working with the poor and, and not doing it in a judgmental way, I wish that more people in South Dakota and in this region would abide by their stated values and their stated beliefs. Because if they are, for example, Christian, what about Christian charity? What about the Beatitudes? What about caring for your fellow man? We see a lot of that disappear when we see interracial tensions. And I find that uh, disheartening, but I think we can move in the right direction. And I think this next generation is they're, much they're more better. diverse yeah. and much more open-hearted and open-minded. Right, uh, but even us old guys <laughs> should be able to throw away our prejudgment, our yeah. prejudices, just yeah. let go. And it, we have nothing to do but gain from mm -hmm. that. That's exactly right. And I tell people, ask yourself, when you see someone who is different, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? Explicit bias, implicit bias, explicit the things that you say. So if hear yourself, what are you saying about the other person that you see? Implicit, what's deep inside of you that has not yet come to the surface that you need to try to pay attention to so that you can get rid of it? If we focus and pay attention to the way that we think and the things that we say, we can then correct it. If we don't pay attention, then we can be in denial. So we've, we've got... Uh... You know, we can talk about diabetes and cancer and addiction. We haven't even touched on addiction. I, I think part of, though, that what we've talked about is, is that adverse childhood experience. If we can work on that, we can fix that. But we've got, you know, maybe 30, 45 minutes each, seconds left. Sandra, the 45-second take-home message. I would love to see people come together to say we have problems that we need to fix collectively as communities. We have people that are 90 miles away from us who have high prevalence and high incidence rates of health conditions that can be managed, that can be treated. It's wonderful that we do mission trips all over the world, but we also have people in our backyard who are right there that we can pull our resources together and make a difference within those communities. And so my call to action is let's all gather together, churches, healthcare organizations, non-healthcare organization, businesses, let's partner and make a difference within the communities that we serve. Okay. 
And Don? And I would agree that I think if we are true to our stated beliefs, we can go the right direction. And I always, and my discussions with a prayer that I was taught a long time ago, and it's, let us remember that we all drink from the same stream of consciousness. We are all connected by that same stream of consciousness. We are all related. What we do to each other, we do to ourselves. Act kindly toward my people, for indeed my people are your people. That's beautiful. We'll be back right after these words. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. And there are diseases that are on the move too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. The first day I met Emil Redfish, physician assistant, we discussed the overuse and over-reliance on medicine in our modern society. How great changes in longevity through the years came instead with proper sanitation, clean water, and the discovery of antibiotics. Although there have been great strides in healthcare through the years, none of them have resulted in such significant drops in overall death rate. Redfish also expressed the value of the vigorous lifestyle of the traditional American Indians and eating closer to what was found in a hunter-gatherer's world like roots, vegetables, berries and fruit, eggs and wild game meat. My colleague is a true Sioux Indian medicine man, a class act, and a dear friend. But despite the sagacity, insight, and traditional perspective he represents, I dare say there are those who, not knowing him, would look at his original American Indian features and prejudge him. Prejudice is a word that means prejudging or making an opinion about an individual using preconceived notions, coming to an opinion before one has the facts. Typical prejudices arise out of attitudes mostly parentally taught about perceived differences in race, gender, gender identity, nationality, social status, sexual orientation, religious affiliation or non-affiliation, age, disability, height, and weight. Anthropologists speculate that stereotyping and acting on prejudice at one time provided a survival advantage. In unpoliced societies, people are safer trusting their family and their community while being careful with outsiders. 10,000 years ago, those looking different than our tribe had a higher chance of causing us harm. Thus, all this is hardwired into our middle brain. But distrust and hating others who are different can also come out of self-doubt, jealousy, and is very destructive, and destructive of those hated, and even more so, the hater. As they say, if you want to destroy your enemy, make him hate. Other research suggests that treating people with respect, not prejudging them by appearance, allows an openness to operate, which in turn churns the wheels of commerce and community and communication. Doesn't it ring true what Martin Luther King Jr. said? I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. It's accurate to say that those who can break free of prejudicial stereotyping are better able to make new friends and find success. It's a great joy and to my great advantage to have friends like Emil Redfish. Well, a great big thank you to our guests, Dr. Don, Don Warren and to Dr. Sandra Ogunremi for helping us in tonight's show. Uh, and that's it for tonight from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, 
Stay healthy out there, people. Major funding for On Call with Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota, and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota State Medical Association, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Black Hills Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Regional Health, Swift Tell Communications.